We did an introduction to Colossians last week in the first chapter, and today we're in the second half of the first chapter. And so if you want to go ahead and turn there, it's going to take me a little while to get there, but I want you to go ahead and turn there to Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. And uh, by the time we get there, you'll be ready to rock. So it's going to be all good. We're going to answer this question today. Who is Jesus? You might think, well, we already kind of know that. I mean, let me just, uh, let's go into this today, because I think you're going to have some things you're going to hear that you might find a little fascinating in our culture today. The question has been asked from the beginning of time, basically the fall of man, when sin entered the world and there was separation from God, this question was asked, who will save us? Who will save us? And the first promise from God that there would be a Messiah who would come would happen shortly after Adam and Eve ate that fruit in the garden from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God speaks directly to Satan after this takes place, and he says in Genesis 3, verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Meaning God is going to send a savior through a woman to take on the sins of the world and crush the devil and his schemes. But the devil will bruise him in this. Now, there is a great debate among scholars and theologians, theologians as to how many prophecies are in the Bible Specifically, Old Testament leading to New Testament. Old Testament predicting the coming of a Messiah. One scholar, for example, his name is J. Barton Payne. He believes there are as many as 574 passages of Old Testament scripture that reference or describe a promised Messiah. Now, that is the biggest number I've heard. There's another scholar named Alfred Eidersheim who believes that the number is probably around 456 prophecies in Old Testament Scripture that point to a coming Messiah. But the most conservative, and this is where most scholars fall, believe there are at least, at minimum, 300 prophecies in Old Testament that point to the coming Messiah. And it is fascinating how, when you go from Old Testament to New Testament, Jesus fulfills every one of these prophecies. So whether it's that big number, the biggest number, or whether it's the 300 number, Jesus fulfills them all. And mathematicians have come along, one, for example, named Peter Stoner, who came along, and he wanted to figure out the mathematical probability that one person could fulfill all of those prophecies. And so he started to crunch the numbers. He got up to 48, not even the 300. If we took the, the, the most conservative number of 300 prophecies in Old Testament that point to a Messiah and Jesus fulfilling them all, he started going down that. And he got to the number 48, not even 300. He got to 48 fulfilled prophecies of what Jesus fulfilled, and he figured out that the mathematical probability that one man in Jesus could fulfill those prophecies was 1 in 10 to the 157th power. Now, you want to know how big that number is, you can't know how big that number is because they don't know how big that number is. Now, keep in mind, that's just 48 of the prophecies, not 300. That number is so big that if you added up all the electrons, neutrons, and subatomic particles in the observable universe, it's still not as big as that number. That's who Jesus is. And yet our Bible tells us the prophecies in the Old Testament, the New Testament, Jesus fulfills them all. And so, however, from the very beginning of the church, that is when followers of Christ were not yet known as Christians, all the way going back to when they were just known as followers of the way. There has been a movement to discredit who Jesus is as the Son of God a movement to discredit that he is the one true Messiah, even though these numbers I just showed you clearly show that this one man did something that blows our minds because he's more than man. He's the son of God. And so from the beginning, the apostles in Scripture and in the New Testament, they were constantly teaching the supremacy of Jesus Christ and who Christ is. That he's not just another teacher who comes along. 
There's even a discussion among the Pharisees when, when the disciples and the apostles were teaching and, and this, this movement of the church is growing and these Pharisees say, we just killed him. And one Pharisee says, well, let it go. Let, it, let, him, let him go. If it's true, it will grow. If it's really of God, it will grow. This takes place in the book of Acts. But if it's not, just like every other false teacher who's come along, it'll go away just like they all have. And they all have, except one. And why is only the one in Jesus' state? Because it's true. And so the apostles taught the supremacy of Jesus Christ, not because they made it up, but because Jesus himself said he was the Son of God who came to take away the sins of the world. That he that he would go to the cross, just like Jonah spent three days in the belly of a whale, and three days later he would rise again. Jesus said of himself that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father but by him. Now, I'm a simple man with a small brain, but I think no one means no one. And Jesus said no one comes to the Father but by him. Why should we believe what Jesus said? Because everything Jesus said happened. And everything Jesus says will happen, will happen. So if he says no one comes to the Father but by him, I don't get to make up my own way to the Father. And yet this is what was happening even from the beginning. The church in Colossians. Jesus taught that he was the Son of God. That God was his Father, and that God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus said to his followers in John 10, verse 28 through 30, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand because I and the Father are one. He would go on to say in John 14, 9, those who have seen me have seen the Father. So when you hear the argument of those who say, well, Jesus never professed to be any more, anything more than a good teacher, I submit to you everything I just read. Now, why am I telling you all this? Because it's a setup for where we are today in the second half of Colossians 1. And Paul is writing his, his epistles here to the churches, and there was a movement among the churches at that time, even in those early days, where false teachers and early heretics would go to great effort to discredit the divinity of Jesus. And so there's just a couple here, in the church of Colossae in particular, there were two groups, basically. One was the Judaizers. Judaizers were those who would profess some form of belief in Jesus, but then basically wouldn't believe that they would be justified by faith and that through grace of Jesus and his work on the cross that they could be saved. The Judaizers were like, no, that's not how it works. We, we need to add on things. We need to return to Mosaic law and have a part of Mosaic law that goes into our belief here. Matter of fact, it went, they went as far as to say, you can't be a follower of Jesus unless you first start by following the Mosaic law. And so Judaizers would come in and bring this in and all these different forms of legalism. And Paul would write all throughout the New Testament combating this legalism that was taking place. In fact, if you, if you on your own reading want to go read Acts chapter 15 and read the whole discussion that takes place trying to combat this Judaizers belief and then putting all these things in place saying, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, you have to do this, 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 and this. And you don't have to go too far to find even churches today who will say, if you want to follow Jesus, it's this, 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 and this. So this is a belief that has been passed down through the years. So that's the Judaizers. Then on this other side, you have what was basically a, uh, let's receive all, a syncretistic, it's called, belief system, which is, let, let's, Let's just, if you want to believe this, okay, let's pull that element. You want to believe this, we can pull that element. You want to believe this. How about, how about we live our own truth? Oh, you thought that was new. It's always been around. In fact, that the, the entire Roman Empire was built on this. You can believe whatever you want, just don't cause trouble. Because ultimately, Caesar's God. 
And so is pulling all these, this is a syncretistic belief of how we do religion, taking the best elements of each religious system, mixing them together to make our own truth. And we're going to get more into some of these false, specific false beliefs next week because chapter two in Colossians is where Paul starts to dig into this a little bit more. But if I could boil this all down in the church of Colossae, what they were facing, it would be this. False teachers were preaching that Jesus is a great man, a wonderful teacher, but he is not God. He is not divine. He is someone to be admired. We can learn from Jesus. There's some great things there. But he's not the only way. And then there was also a teaching that God accepts all forms of worship, of which Jesus is an in, a vital ingredient. So this is where Paul is writing in Colossians and saying, we need to address these issues specifically. This thought that is false, that Jesus is great, he's just not enough. And there's a lot of times here, as I look across this room, and we've had these discussions before, where I've had conversations with people who say, listen, I know Jesus is wonderful, and I know Jesus saves, and I know all those things, but I've done some things. You don't know my life. Surely, Jesus can't cover it all. There's that side of things. Or there's others who might say, surely Jesus doesn't want it all from me. Surely he doesn't want me to deny myself completely. Doesn't he want me to be happy? Doesn't he want me to pursue my goals and my dreams? Why is it all about him? Surely Jesus isn't like that. And we start forming our own things. So then, since Jesus isn't like that in my mind, and Jesus isn't like that in your mind, how about this? You do what you think Jesus is, I'll do what I think Jesus is, and we'll have our own little happy Jesus. Not a capital J, little j. And this is what is taking place here, and this is why Paul wants to address what's happening in the church at Colossae. If you remember, Epaphras went to Paul and said, hey, I could use a letter here. It might be kind of getting away from me just a little bit. But what if we pull this into our current context? What, is, what are some things I could give you today to show you that this wasn't just a church at Colossae problem? This is a problem even today. In 2022, LifeWay Research poll uh, did a, a, a survey. It's called the State of Theology in America Survey. And they made statements to those who are uh, not believers, and then they made statements to evangelical professing Christians and wanted to get results and see where is the state of theology in the church today. And so they started off with, I'm going to put this one statement up here first because this is what I've been talking about. They said this, Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. They asked this question to those who didn't believe, and they asked this question to those who did believe. Now, the number who don't believe, okay, I'm, I don't even need to show you that number. They don't believe. But I'm going to show you the number that evangelical Christians said. Jesus was a great teacher. He was not God. 43% of those professing to be evangelical Christians agreed with this statement, which was up from just 30% just two years earlier. So in those two years, it jumped 13%. Another statement was made. They said, God accepts the worship of all religions. 56% of evangelical Christians agreed with this statement. One final statement. They said, the Bible, like all sacred writings, contains helpful accounts of ancient myths, but is not literally true. 26% of evangelical Christians agreed with that statement. But the truly frightening number is that it was up from just 15% two years earlier. Now, you might ask, where are these numbers coming from? And I'm so glad you asked that. According to another poll that uh, George Barna and his group were involved in at the Arizona Christian University in 2022, they asked questions to pastors, and they asked about trying to find what pastors' biblical worldview was and if they held a biblical worldview. And just so you know, a biblical worldview is basically this. You teach and you believe that all of our lives, our morals, and our values, and the final authority comes from Scripture and the Bible. That's a biblical worldview. When they did this survey, more than six of every ten pastors, 62%, hold to a syncretistic worldview, not a biblical worldview. 
So that's, I'm, in that, I'm in that group, but I'm doing all I can to teach truth. Now, this isn't just senior pastors. It includes all pastors, senior, associate, children's, youth, executive. You can just kind of go down the line. Only 38, 39% of pastors teach that the Bible is final authority and is non-moving and that God's word is final. George Barna, who oversaw this, uh, this poll, he stated this, it certainly seems that if America is going to experience a spiritual revival, the awakening is needed just as much in the pulpit as it is in the pews. So, when I start off a sermon and say, we're going to talk about who is Jesus. If someone were to happen to read one of these surveys or things like that and wants to know where Pastor Josh stands on these issues, allow me to share with you who I believe Jesus is. And I'm going to start with Colossians chapter 1. Here is the answer in verse 15 through 23. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind and doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. And we'll stop there for right now. The main purpose of this function is for Paul to write that Jesus is the one and only. And Jesus, in that first line, he says he is the image of the invisible God. Rewind all the way back to Genesis when God says, let us create man in our own image. God uses a plural there to describe that Jesus was there from the beginning. And Paul says he is the image of the invisible God. In the book of John, when you open up that gospel, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus is the word. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. That word that Paul uses for image is a Greek word called, you, I'm going to get the pronunciation wrong, icon, E-I-K-O-N. And it's not that uh, Jesus is just a replica or a representative. It is a word that's actually used to show that Jesus became flesh. God became flesh and dwelt among us, which is the story we're going to hear coming up this Christmas. And not only did he become flesh and dwelt among us, he is the one who holds all things together, Paul says. This is an important thing to understand when we're thinking, well, Jesus is just a part of a mix. No, he's not. He's, he's the container who's holding all things together. And the implications of this are profound. All things means all things, visible or invisible. We can have our rulers and our powers and our authorities and our dominions and our kingdoms and all these things that are lowercase letters. And all of those things do not have authority over Jesus. Nothing. There is no belief, no structure, nothing that human beings come up with our own minds that can become a final authority. It just makes no sense. And, and the scripture tells us that all knees will bow to Christ. And they must bow. Because he created the knees. I think one of the, the crazy things about life is Jesus, he loves us so much that he allows us to live our lives. We, we have freedom. We have these choices. We have these things that we can do. We can even go as far as to make up our own way. And he allows these things to take place and, and to happen. 
That's love. And people say things all the time, well, then why would God even create us? If we're not going to choose him, if we're not going to go this path, if we're not going to do this, why would, why would God have us be his children if we call on his name and, and when we, he just knows we're going to let him down? Great. I submit to you, why did you ever have kids? <laughs> I remember when we were talking about it. We are like, well, you know, I think it's time we have some kids and stuff like that. I think it's going to be great that they will always listen they will always follow our way. They will always understand that we are the truth and what we speak is the way to go. I'm telling you now, we've been parents for 20 years and that's how it's gone. <laughs> that's how it's gone. But going back to this, that Jesus holds all things together. Some of you may remember this. Some of you may not know. Pastor Louis Giglio did an entire message on this where he, he uses this scripture in Colossians, and he says that all things are held together. And he gets to this point where he says, have you heard of the molecule l laminin? It's an adhesive molecule that's inside the human body that holds cell structure and things together. And he puts this picture on the screen, and laminin, it's actually the picture of a cross is what, is what the molecule looks like. It's a really cool moment. Now, it's important for us to understand the cross, that cross right there doesn't save us. Amen. Jesus and his work on the cross is what saves us. Jesus is our Messiah. Jesus is our Lord and Savior when we call upon his name. The cross was the tool he used to, to, to do that work for us, okay? So I want to take that. As all, I don't want to take away from Louis Giglio's presentation at all. The cross just becomes that symbol for us to remember Jesus. We can wear a cross around our neck, but I know a lot of people who have tattoos of crosses or wear crosses around their neck that ain't living for Jesus. Jesus is the one. And that's where we should direct our attention. He is the one who holds all things together, not only in all creation, but in our bodies and in his church. And Paul will say there to the church at Col Colossians, did you catch it? He is also the head of the church. Not your, not your pastor, not the elders, not the deacons, not anyone else. Jesus Christ is the head and the final authority of the church. And churches have gone too far down this path of thinking, well, we'll be the ones to determine what we think the final word is. That's not what Scripture says. And I can, I can declare to you and, and proudly say that this church has always been one that's heart and mind is set on wanting to teach the truth in Jesus Christ and to say that the word, the Bible, is the final authority and the literal truth, and it is God's word. And Paul said what we must do then when we come to that place is we must reconcile our lives to that, to Christ. What does reconcile then mean? If we all were to do a little exercise right now, I got my, my iPad and whatever, you don't have to shout it out, but if we, if we all were to take on our phones and, and turn it on and look at it and we would say, what time is it right now? All right, so we could do that. What time is it right now? 10.43. That's the time that it is. Why is that? Because this iPad and your phones and all of that are getting a signal from a GPS tower that is sending that time to your phone. But that tower gets the time from a satellite. And that satellite gets its signal from an atomic clock, which is set. All of our phones and our equipment, our devices, are reconciled to one final authority. And the same thing goes with Scripture and God's Word and who Jesus Christ is. Paul is saying, we are reconciled to Christ. We are set to Him and His Word. Walking in that unity, walking in that authority. And he's, he's sharing these things because he wants them to see you're going to get pulled in different directions. You're going to have teaching that, that pulls you here and here and all of these different places. And he wants them to see that Jesus is the one who holds all things together. Set your mind, set your actions, build your entire life on Jesus Christ and his word. That's what it means to be reconciled 
to Christ. And there are a lot of people who say a prayer and say, I believe in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. There are a lot of people who walk up to the front of an altar, bow their knee, say a prayer, and then get up and walk out and continue on in the same lifestyle. That's not being reconciled to Christ. Reconciled to Christ is a complete change and a transformation that begins. You don't get there right away, but it begins, and you understand that I want to pursue Christ with everything that I am. And I kind of shared this last week. There have been times in, in my own life, and I'm sure you have times in your life, when you have decisions or things that you want to do and live life in your way. But for a believer in Christ who says, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, and I deny myself and I follow him, you will inevitably run into times when your way is not his way. Which way are you choosing? Syncretistic beliefs chooses your way. And in choosing your way, then you take what you believe is God's way and you form it to fit your way. And so even from the book of Colossians and even in Scripture, the apostles are writing about this and Jesus speaks about this in the Gospels and he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. Now, I said it much more sympathetic than I think he probably said it because he was just sharing the truth. There's an age-old illustration that you're going to go, oh my gosh, Pastor Josh, that is so tired, but it's true. If you're in the middle of the road and a truck is barreling down on you, I'm not going to yell, live your own truth. There is no truck. No, there is. And I don't want to live in a world where you would say to me, why didn't you tell me? Now, we live in a culture today where when someone says, this is who Jesus is, like there's a message. I'm sure someone may be sitting here today going, Pastor Josh, you're that guy. You're going to be that guy. Great. Okay. You think you got the one and only way. Well, yeah, I, I do. But not because I made it up. Because it's here. And I can assure you there are plenty of other teachers. Just go on YouTube or go wherever you want to go who are going to tell you exactly what your itching ears want you to hear. And then you'll find that that's also in Scripture. And so I just want to share with you the truth in, in the way that I can because Paul says the only way to be holy and blameless and righteous in the eyes of God is through Jesus Christ. He's the only one. And so to Judaizers in Colossians, Paul would say we are no longer beholden to the law because Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. To those who think that Jesus is just another great teacher, Paul would say, no, don't water down Jesus in, in that way. There are truth preachers who preach Jesus, and there are false teachers who preach a false gospel. Choose this day who you will follow. Steadfast truth in Christ or an ever-changing, ever-shifting, never-satisfying false religion. There's no two ways about it. In fact, verse 23, if I were to just read that again, Paul will then say, because he knows, hey, this is, this is straightforward teaching here. He'll say, if indeed you continue in the faith, we're about to find out if it's real. We're about to find out if the words you said and when you confess Christ as your Lord and Savior or when you walked that aisle or when you, when you made that devoted life to follow Christ, we're about to find out if, you're, if that was authentic, if you're going to continue on in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, became a minister. So we're going to find out if, if it's shifting. And now... I had an interesting conversation on the podcast with Judd Granzow. We got into this. I was going to have Judd preach it, but it's, it's so good that I'm going to steal it from him right from under his feet. Um, we were talking about at the end of Matthew chapter 7 when Jesus is doing the, the Sermon on the Mount, and then Jesus gives the parable that says, He who hears these words of mine builds his house on a rock. When the rains come and the winds and the storms and all those things that beat up against the house, it will stand because it has a firm foundation. It is built on the rock. And then he's, Jesus will go on to say, and he who doesn't follow or listen to these words of mine builds his house on the sand. 
when the rains come and the wind blows and all that, it will blow the house down because the, the foundation was not firm. And Judd, in the conversation, he pointed this out. And I, I, I should have known this, and you probably should have known it too. But the way he said it blew my mind. He said, you know where sand comes from? The rock. It's shaved off eroded rock. That's what sand is. And I Googled it right there on the spot, live on the podcast, because I couldn't believe it. And it's right there. There it is. What building on the sand is, is shaving off your truth to build your life on that. Not the rock, but on the sand. And Jesus says, when you shave off that rock and you build your life on eroded truth, it's not truth. And the storm will come. And the rains will blow. So we don't get to pick and choose. And we think in our lives, well, why would God do that? We just don't get to pick and choose. And, and I think, let me flip that question on its ear and say, how wonderful that God told you. They let you know that he's the one and only. We were talking to our neighbors last night. They were on a walk, and we were just talking about the house and stuff. We have some construction projects going on at the house. And our neighbor said, oh, yeah, yeah, we've had so many things we've had to fix over the years. There was this one time I had contractors who built us a shower. And come to find out, they didn't build it correctly. They didn't put the right waterproofing materials in there. They didn't put any waterproofing materials in there. They just built it with regular drywall, slapped some tile over the top of it. And then years later, I had to dump the whole thing down in the crawl space because it all rotted out and fell in there. But I submit to you this. When they finished building it, it looked awesome. It was built on truth with a hidden lie. That's taking rock, shaving it off, building on sand. That's how it works. And we think to ourselves, I'm going to make decisions, and it's going to work for me right now in the present, and I'm going to live my life based on this. And eventually, it caves in, and we wonder, why didn't anyone tell me? And me, as pastor, it's not me trying to say that I've got a one-way ticket to knowledge and you don't. I just know my role that God called me to be a pastor and to share truth. And there have been times over the years that people don't like me because of it. I'm not called to be liked. I'm called to teach God's word. And so every single Sunday, and I do the same thing like when we take communion, to me it's, it's Lord, forgive me of my sins. Reveal them to me, the ones I, I know and the ones I don't. Lord, forgive this microphone right now. <laughs> Make it work. That when I read your word, you'll reveal things to me. Lord, that might not be the things I want to hear necessarily or the things I need to know, but that your Holy Spirit would guide me to make decisions that follow after you because I want to be holy and blameless in your your eyes, Lord. I want to build my life on the rock, you, not on shifting sand. I will continue on in the faith, as Paul says here. I will not be pulled in every different direction. And this is a growing problem in the church at Colossae, but it's become a full-blown epidemic in this culture today. The search for our own truth and our own identity apart from God if Jesus is who he says he is, and I believe he is, that he is the one and only, then I believe in this. The only identity there is in this world is when you confess Christ as your Lord and Savior and you become his child. That's your identity. There is no other identity. Our scripture today shows us that there is no truth or identity that is apart from, from Christ. All things are held together by him. You either claim your identity in Christ and accept Jesus as Lord become his child, or you are lost. And it's hopeless. And it's easy to get sad in that, but just stop and say, but wait a minute, if he is the one and only way, he's told us he's the way. That's the hope. Searching for an identity outside of Christ, since Christ is the all in all, means that no identity will ever be found outside of him. That's the truth. And any search for identity that happens outside of Christ is a pursuit to destruction. And so, today in our culture, 
So many are on an endless pursuit of identity, and it has become their new idolatry. Because nowhere in God's word will it say that your identity should be found anywhere than, but, than in Christ. Idolatry means we place the importance of self before God, before Jesus. And placing self before Jesus is shifting sand. You have shaved the rock, and the end is destruction. And Colossians 1 tells us nothing comes before Jesus. He is our firm foundation, the rock on which we stand. He's the one and only. And so Paul concludes the chapter with that word. Verses 24 through 29. He says, because of this, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Remember, he's in prison. And in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. And you might ask, what's the mystery? The mystery is all those prophecies. The mystery is of ask, ask, answering the questions, who will save us? The mystery has been revealed in Christ. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is this, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. And Paul will finish and says, it is for this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. That is why Paul will write in other places that I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come will be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Because Christ is in us, he is the hope of glory. And every time I get faced with a trial or a struggle or a tribulation, I consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, because I am doing this work and I am standing for the truth. And let me just encourage you to follow in the same way. Attending a church service on a Sunday morning should, should send you running to your Bible to open it up and read it for yourself and learn and make sure your pastor isn't one of those six and ten who's leading you down a wrong path. So that you know Scripture so well. All I am is an assist to you as you sit in the pew. so that you would know Christ is your Lord, so you would be passionate about him, to do everything you can to follow his way, the only way. And so we're going to continue on in this. We're going to go into it next week in Colossians when he starts getting a little more specific in things. Matter of fact, next week we're going to get into how they started worshiping angels different things that they would do. And maybe, maybe we'll even get hit on a couple things that you might go, okay, this is getting a little too real. So I want to encourage you to come back and be a part of it. But I want to encourage you today to just make your prayer be, okay, Lord Jesus, inevitably we all live our lives in a way that maybe we just get off the path a little bit. And Lord, reveal your truth. Show me where I've filled in the blanks on this truth stuff that's me and remove that so I can follow your truth, your ways, because you are the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by you. Who is Jesus? He's your Lord and Savior, the one and only, the only way to the Father. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the book of Romans tells us if we confess with our mouths and believe with our hearts that Jesus Christ is Lord and rose from the dead, that his, his death is away our sins, and we, we believe that, we call on his name, we are saved. And that Holy Spirit then comes in, into our hearts when we, when we say that with a sincere heart, and then we are, are given guidance by the Holy Spirit to live a life to follow him. I want to invite you to do that. 
Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we come to you right now and we know that your Holy Spirit is on the move and we're so thankful for that. None of us in this room could ever claim to be perfect. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to make decisions, Lord, and you know this, that will, that will favor ourselves and, and that's going to happen, Lord, and yet your grace is sufficient for us. Your work on the cross covers it all. When we come to you with a repentant heart and we say, Lord Jesus, forgive me. I follow you. I serve you. Your word says you are faithful and just to forgive our sins. Lord, you cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And you receive us, Lord, and we become your child. And if anyone in this room, Lord, does not know you, I pray that this would be the beginning of an eternal life journey of calling on your name. And I thank you for it that we would build our house on the rock, which is you, and nothing else. Thank you for Paul's word to Colossians, where he just, in the best way that I know in Scripture, just describes who you are completely. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.